and via her, her doctoral research and reading of Buddhist philosophy together with her life experience have all led to a fundamental belief and experience of change, choice and freedoms. Her books, uh, and <coughs> you've brought some, so if, if anybody wants uh, to, to get a copy this evening, they're here. Um, her books are a kind of three-part journey in themselves and are an expression of sharing that glorious and creative path. So thank you very much. Thank you. I feel I'm in good company, thanks, Alex, um, after what you've said about, about learning and education, um, that it is actually about um, sharing and cooperation. I'll say a wee bit more about that in a minute. <clears throat> yes, um, what I've, I suppose having written a third book um, a big, and putting it, I put it out in September, I've been thinking, actually, there is a, there's a, a progression here from the first book to the third book. And that made me think then about there is a path, actually, and what I want to share with you tonight, really, is the theoretical construct that those books are, are based on, um, which I think, will, I think will ring bells with you. So my, my professional career was as an educationist, and I, I had, a very strong, uh, had very strong evidence of education as transformation. Um, you, I saw it particularly, I think, in in youngsters uh, who were disadvantaged, um, who suddenly grew and developed um, through a good nurturing environment. I saw it in adult returners. I, did a, I was an inspector of education, so I was in 42 colleges in Scotland, and I saw a lot of adults learning. And a lot of those adults had come back to learning um, in order to have a different life. They had, you know, their, their circumstances were not what they wanted or they felt disadvantaged in some way and learning was a pathway forward for them. So um, there's that experience. Um, I particularly enjoyed seeing when I was a young teacher, uh, my, my lads, you know, who were very difficult in the classroom, you know, but then put, we put them out in work experience and they were wonderful, you know. And again, then when they came back, you know, they were absolutely full of joy and worked and really succeeded. Um, I was also on the children's panel. I served three years on that after I retired. And again, some wonderful examples, some shining heroes, actually, of, of, and heroines of, of young people who'd come from very, very hard circumstances, who suddenly found, found something in education and it moved them forward. So I think transformation, uh, education transformation, Really, it really is that. My own life experience um, is, I mean, I, I'll read you a bit from Language of My Choosing, maybe later, but my own life experience is that I was uh, born in, um, into a, an immigrant family post-war, um, and my grandfather had been caught up, they were Italian, my grandfather had been caught up in, the, in World War II and was taken as a prisoner of war, um, and he drowned on a boat called the Island of the Star. 400 Italians died on that boat. Um, so uh, it, was, it, was, it, well, it wasn't a marked boat, I'll have to say. We could go on about the politics of that. Um, but the point about this is that my, um, my childhood home was not a happy one. Uh, I was an only child in the home that was... I was born about eight years after all this happened... Um, I think there was a lot of guilt, a lot of shame around, um, and that hung very heavy in, in, you know, in, my, in the environment I grew up in. Added to which my mother, not a clever idea, married a Scotsman, uh, which wasn't a good idea because of the political situation. Um, he turned out to be a drunk and, and, and the domestic, domestic violence. So I didn't have a very happy childhood. Anyway, but as you just, you know. So, um, the, the, the catalyst for me was when I started to board, actually. I became a boarder because they thought that was a good idea. Um, and it was for me because I suddenly saw my own life ahead of me, a life that I could make. I was freed from this awful environment that I felt I grew up in um, that was very, very depressed and found my own pathway and I felt able to make my own life. So... For me, as for all these different reasons, I think education 
can be, not always, but it can be transformative. Now, it isn't always transformative because I think, and I'm going to be controversial here, and I've, by the way, I had some fun um, going back and looking at my research when I was preparing this talk. It was great. I took about that. Oh, did I write that? You know, great fun. But um, I think there are two models, really, from my reading of education. One is a reproductive model, which is a politicization of education which is that what we do in education is we reproduce um, the values of a certain sector of the community. Um, we see education in economic terms only. And, you know, that, and that was something that I railed against constantly as an inspector of education. So that's the, that's the reproduction model. And I've seen it. I've seen it in classrooms. I'm sure you, you're aware of that. You've had experience of that. The other is a resistance model of education. And that is where you speak to the human heart, where the human being is absolutely allowed to flourish, where you see the learning context as a liberating tool. Um, and I'm going to just contrast, I'm just going to throw a couple of names around. Foucault, for instance, saw education as a means of social control. Merton saw it as uh, what he talked about, an ideological clash where children come with a certain set of values and they're downgraded in favour of the prevailing values of society. Senate and Cobb talk about uh, children coming as injured and in a sense they visit that injury in the, in the classroom, particularly where they're not valued. On the other hand, we've got Freire who talks about education being liberating, <coughs> education as a democratic tool, education as allowing people to be more fully human, um, to educate is to educate in terms of the practice of freedom. He talks about empowerment. He's a wonderful read. If you haven't read Freire, he is fantastic to read. Um, Giroud talks about the need for a radical pedagogy which speaks to the individual. And if you look at some of the feminist literature, it's all about cooperation and collaboration. Heron writes about education being a, a means of cooperative inquiry. So basically, all of these things, um, that radical view of education, if you like, um, leads you to look at education in terms of providing spaces where people can self-make where they can be dialogical, where they can be dialogical with one another and dialogical within themselves. And leading to the theories about identity, and as I read it, there are two fundamental camps. One is that identity is culturalist, it's fixed, you're born a certain way and that's you, you go through life in a certain way. The other, and I think you're going to agree with me, Alex, is the one where um, we constantly, throughout our lives, self-make. We construct our identity. We construct our, we improvise our identity. Our identity is flexible. We do it all the time in different circumstances. We're one person with one group of people, we're somebody with somebody else, we're someone with some, another person with our family, and we go through life self-making. Um, the only part of our identity which is fixed is that drive to actually self-make. That is permanent, and the rest is about improvisation, responsiveness. And so if we posit an education system or a classroom, a learning, a learning environment, where um, we allow the human being to, to flourish, to be who they are, and we support them in that, we enable them to be that, then they are enabled to be the person, or to self-make, to be the person that they truly are, to keep self-making, to generate that sense of, of individuality that is part of their, their destiny, if you like. So uh, Markova talks about dialogicality. Dialogicality um, is really about what is spoken or unspoken between two people. And in the, in the interchange between those two people and that communication, both emerge slightly different and slightly changed. 
Now, that dialogicality in a classroom is a wonderful thing in a, in a learning environment. Um, and my, my research, I looked at six uh, students who, who were in a very nurturing, valuing, safe learning environment. Um, and that dialogicality was allowed to flourish. You could see it in terms of the way they had moved themselves from, for instance, a woman that had just gone to a night class to learn about IT, suddenly seeing herself as a, going to university and becoming a social worker, becoming professional. There are lots of examples of that. So um, that, in, in very, very brief, simple terms, I think, is, is where, I'm, where I'm coming from. I don't know if anybody wants to ask anything just now, um, but before, before I go on. I had a question. I didn't want to interrupt your, yeah. your flow, which was to ask. In the, I mean, num I've got a numbers brain, not a word brain. I'd never heard of a word dialogical before, so I needed educated. I hadn't either, so I started reading from our <laughs> um, <laughs> um, It's a, I mean, there, there's a lot around. I mean, when I was, when I was thinking about the PhD, I was thinking about. Because I'm a linguist, I was thinking that dialogue, there's something in dialogue, actually, that actually, um, there's more to it than words. And I began to think, well, how, how, can, how does that affect um, identity in the way, you know, you know um, and there's a lot around dialogue, and Brunner even talked about dialogue years ago and so on, you know, there's something about dialogue. But dialogicality is really, I think, based on dialogue, but it, is, it takes it a stage, stage further. It takes it beyond, it actually, it actually tries to encapsulate what I'm trying to say, which is, in a sense, non-verbal exchange as well as verbal exchange. Um, I feel like individuals coming together in some way, in some kind of creative exchange, actually, um, as either felt or... or, or or spoken. Does that, does that, um, does that, does yes. that yeah, yeah. I think that's what your, your example is that we're sitting around a table here and we've got gestures which, you know, I hated Teams and Zoom meetings for that very reason in that there was no yeah. sort of, yeah. no gestures. Yeah. You couldn't really, in, you know, if someone was speaking, you couldn't really interrupt very easily to sort of make a point like I just did. No, that's right. Which I've, so I'm not going to do Zoom meetings ever again, actually, mm. unless it's another pandemic, I think, probably. Um, so, <laughs> which happened. Um, so, all of this really says that we are the architects of our own lives and our own selves. And I, I felt that particularly. I mean, I, as, a, as an, a friend of mine at Catania University, I just put out a book, actually, um, and she just featured the Scottish-Italian literary output, if I can call it a literary output, um, about, and, and she's focused on hybridity. And the way I see it is that, yes, I'm a hybrid, but actually it's a wonderful thing because you sit on the boundaries of, 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 of two cultures, actually, and you have huge choices. Um, in a way that maybe other people don't have the same extent. Um, like, I, I, was, I don't believe I was formed. I didn't have an upbringing as such because of all that I've tried to explain, and I know people like that. So I was free to make what I want to locate myself. And I think, and working from that boundary of, you know, not Italian, not wholly Italian, not wholly Scottish, somewhere in between, and you think, well, who do I, who do I want to be? Um, what, what, what lifestyle do I want to have? What, what, what do I want to make of myself? How do you use the word culture? What culture do you want what, to What culture do I want, mm -hmm. exactly. Or, or, um, or do I want to just be multicultural? You know, so, so, so self-made, I, I believe that if you look at, if you take, if you accept the the, you know, the, the concept of a constructed identity, then what a wonderful freedom that is. I mean, it can be unsettling too. I was reading Pima Chodan today, who, who's writing about um, the bardo, and um, uh, it's not something I really want to, 
get too heavily into, but I think I probably should at my age. But um, you know, the bad is that bit to that bit between life and death, where you're you know you're kind of transiting from one to the other. I'm not sure about reincarnation. We'll not get we'll not get into that at all. But what she was saying was that our lives are about. Um, a bardo, really, because, you know, there's deaths all the time in that you have, you know, what you did at lunchtime has got dead and gone and what you're doing now is dead and gone, well, we dead and gone in a few minutes and all that. So basically we need to we need to um, accept that, that there's death and change all the time. Now, um, you could say that's unsettling, that um, the fact that we are self-making all the time is unsettling, that there's no fixed thing, that we are not fixed unsettling may be frightening, death is frightening, all of these things. But the way I see it is that it's a fantastic opportunity, actually, to, to, be, to be anything we want. It's, it's, you know, and I mean, the Buddhists talk about, you know, another t- wonderful 24 hours to do something. In. And to, to the, the, so the, the, it's a tremendous freedom, actually, about seeing identity as constructed, as constantly self-making, you know, it, it, as I say, it is a bit unsettling too, you know, because you think, well, I rely on my upbringing, I rely on my, I rely on my culture, I rely on um, the uh, societal norms, I rely on expectations of me, uh, formations, I rely, that, that's, that's very secure, perhaps, but isn't it more wonderful to think about, <coughs> I can be who I want to be, actually. Um, I can choose, yes. Uh, um, Amelina, I'm sure if, if that is really possible throughout the world. and I do, I'm really unsure if one can transcend their identities throughout the world. I don't know how it happens in Europe and England, but back in South Asia is that you might be flirting into different identities. For example, like my parents have recently baptized themselves and we are born in like a Hindu family, mm-hmm. but... For them, like, it's an identity change and I'm like, I'm having an identity crisis right now. But yeah. the society would always see them as the way they are born. Yeah. So, so it's, I think identity, when I really talk about identity, I think it's a lot spiritual. Mm-hmm. And you might end up practicing whatever, but still the society is so heavily, uh, you know, sort of the societal norms are so heavy. And I'm talking, I could talk about South Asia because I'm from there. Sure. Is that uh, I would really, uh, I'm really not sure if the identity would keep that leverage. It's also because there, are, in India, like there are a lot of uh, people who are born in like the so called low caste communities yeah. who transform into Buddhism yeah. so that they renounce Hinduism and then they accept Buddhism. Yeah. But still, at the end of the day, their identities or like their ancestral identity never goes away. So even though you are practicing something else and your children are practicing something else and it could be like for last hundred years, but still end of it like on documents and on uh, on on a state level or on a citizenship level, you would be still seen as a as a person belonging to a certain caste. Yeah. So here the identity is sort of changing and they're trying to practice an agency and XYZ and XYZ. Yeah. But still the stigma of the society, you know, it, it remains so static. So I'm, I'm really not sure if, you know, like identity. So at, that's what I'm saying. At a spiritual level, one could feel like really oh. easy, but it's just a society. One had, always walks out of the room and then, you know, it's just a society that gives you a mirror all the time. Yes. So at spiritual level, I 100% agree. Yeah. I, but because we, because I, 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 I would see like a, me, a, like, you know, I myself as a unit in a society and not just me myself. So I, I think it's quite tough to sort of, you know, transgress uh, the boundaries of identity. And it's, it's one can like define oneself in X, Y, Z ways. But once it's a step out, there's always a mirror. So it's always that tussle at spiritual level you can be, but... I don't know how could one sort of navigate the ideas of, you know, having... Money. I think it may be different in the Western world. I think yeah, that's probably yeah. right. But I think also you're talking about the difference between an internal... You know, the inter- you're saying that internally, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. as, as a person, yeah. as a growing person, as a changing person, yeah. you can be who you want to be. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you have those choices. Yeah. But in terms of your actions, the way you act, mm-hmm. um, and in terms of social 
it's your social practice, you are confined by by tradition and culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, and I think that's a very fair point. Actually, I think that's mm-hmm. true. We see that in the trans debate. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think so. We that's a very that's int- interesting because you have brought up the differences. I think between between East and West. There, actually, it's interesting. Yes. Um, at the same time, I mean, Buddhism does um, does really promote the whole notion of of self um, and um, individuality and choice and freedom. It's very central to Buddhist thinking. Um, so that's, uh, and you'll know that. So I um, because I think it's it's also like what we call context and culture. Yes. Because even within Buddhism, like there are so many Buddhisms. <laughs> like although I have no expert to talk about it and I myself do not have any like personal connect. So I would rather refrain to sort of make heavy comments. But even within Buddhism, there are so many Buddhisms because what in South Asia comes is that the identity is like so, it's, it's like a slap. You know, like you just cannot, uh, you know, transcend the community in which you are born. No matter you might be rich or no matter you might have X, Y, Zs, but still it comes down to community. And even when you are sort of claiming to be a Buddhist, still like which community do you come from? That person still remains static, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's India, whether it's Myanmar, whether it's Bangladesh or whether it's Nepal or what, whatever. Like, And, and I, this is this has to be like, I might not make that sense, but this this... You know, this traveling narrative has to go very empirical. So, <laughs> I don't know, like, whether you have experience, whether you have traveled have, or not. I have, some, I have quite a lot of experience of Buddhism because I became a Buddhist about eight years ago. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've been in two kind of camps, the Zen Buddhist of Thai Nhat Hanh in, in, uh, in, uh, near Bordeaux in France. Um, and, and also Tibetan Buddhism, but Holy yeah. Tibetan Buddhism. Mm-hmm. But it's a fundamental principle in yeah. all of Buddhism, yes. no matter what. And that is... The, the concept of impermanence, mm-hmm. which is what I was alluding to earlier. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that ties in very strongly with the kind of arguments I'm making really for, for self-making and, and, and the possibility of change and freedom and choice and all of that, mm-hmm. and that nothing stays the same. And it's Thay Nhat Hanh who said, you're the blue sky and all the rest is just weather. You know, there is a, there is a, you know, so, um, so that, that, and that, that's a lovely, it's so, it's so liberating that I actually think, well, this is a hard time, but it'll, it'll pass, you know. Um, and think, it, you know, you're, you're quite right that some cultures are much more restricted and much more rigid in how you're allowed to live and how you're allowed to be interpreted. And I don't want to minimise that in any way, but the same applies actually even in this culture. I mean, I am a man. There are certain things that are expected of me as a man as opposed to being anything else. When I went to live in England for a while, I was a Scotsman. And, you know, <laughs> I had to, to be a Scotsman for, for the English audience, if you like. <laughs> you know, there are lots of little things like that, that where there are expectations that are put on you and you're expected to live up to them in some way. There, there, there are constraints on what you're expected to do or not do but, as a result of that. But, and can, that, can, that can have a knock-on effect on actually what results you get, the practical mm-hmm. results you get once you go out the door. Mm-hmm. You know, it, um, you can say you can adopt a particular di- uh, identity, but if you're in a culture where it's not going to get accepted, you might not get practical results. Well, you can adapt. I mean, I think, I mean, I, um, I, I mean, I would say, I mean, I, I would say that whatever the expectations, um, you know, they can be challenged, you know, that, that would be my response to you. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I was reading a very interesting book called The Macho Scene. I can't remember if it was by, but actually there was a woman, uh, it's a very recent book. Um, I didn't get very far, but what was interesting was she was lamenting the expectations of motherhood. Mm-hmm. And I thought this was fascinating. You know, like, do you really, you know, you must get joint satisfaction from breastfeeding. No, I hate it, you know. And um, you must, you know, your child is must, you must be so proud of your child. Well, actually, that's not, you know, like, you know, there, uh, there's, there's certain impositions put on people in certain roles. 
masculinity, you know, it's a huge thing, actually, causing huge problems for young men, for instance, you know. Um, and I, th- I think it's important, and I think we, we do live in a society now where we can be much more open, where we can challenge these things and say, you know, um, I, 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 don't, um, I don't model myself in any particular model of femininity. I'm, I'm me. Um, if I cross borders, I cross borders. I mean, I, I don't care. I mean, I've worn bow ties. I've worn, I've worn tails. I wear fr- sparkly dresses. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm not a cross dresser. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I once actually upset people because I did turn up in tails for lunch once actually. But so I think, you know, we can challenge. I think my children have said to me, um, got three daughters actually who've said that they very much value um, the, lib- the, the very f- uh, um, the liberty they had um, when they were when they were g- grew up I mean there was no homework time in my house there was no bedtime there was nothing they just and they've all done reasonably well you know what I mean so they're, they're fine um, so I think I think the point is um, to be true to yourself and to challenge um, expectations and norms. I mean, I was reading um, Akon Rupoche, right, talking about restoring balance for weeks. So I've been trying. I've been reading Buddhist things. So I've been trying to settle myself after the excitement of putting the book out. And um, he 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 writes about freedoms from norms. It's important to feel free yourself from norms, free yourself to, from tradition. It's important to say, I know my parents did it that way, but I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it the way that actually I'm inclined to do it. Um, and so you recreate yourself. So it was interesting that he says that, and it coincides for me with all that stuff about self-making and identity. Um, and there's a lot of connections around the resistance to change or the performative aspect of identity requiring degrees of uncertainty. That can be to increase our comfort with uncertainty. It's something that we're quite allergic to in many ways. And also change is something that you feel resistance from at a societal level, but also from acceptance of yourself. Yeah. It's not a living process. Um, but I think that change is hard <laughs> and sometimes quite slow, can manifest in many different ways, personally and society. And there is a fear, actually, isn't there, about challenge and, and, and in a sense, asserting yourself, you know, whoever you want to be. I think there is a fear and an uncertainty. That's, I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? Um, um, well, uh, it's a, big, a major point of uncertainty in the, I think Rishi Sunak's AI conference was actually, I think, I, I get the feeling it was actually designed to scare people uh, mm-hmm. into accepting unemployment in the, and you are announcing at the end of it that none of you will have jobs. And then it's sort of final one where a citizen basic income is, is what you'll have and then you'll be able to do what you want. You'll be paid like a pensioner. Mm-hmm. Except you wouldn't have had to work all your life to, to get it. There's no doubt that politicians muddy our waters greatly, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly are limiting. I think in terms of our freedoms. But you talked about the fear of... of, of I was thinking of, from like more yeah. Plato's cave idea that you know you are have an expectation of this reality and then if fundamental belief systems are altered, you know, you go out of the cave and suddenly you realise everything you took for granted was just a mere shadow of that reality. And yes. then going back and convincing others that what they're living is not an authentic version or there's other possibilities mm. you can receive massive mm-hmm. resistance <laughs> you know you can be mm-hmm. rejected from you can be in danger family. yeah in danger you and can then, actually be in danger and then yeah. people who have been used to having to navigate uncertainty whether that's about being safe yeah. um, they become very good at living in a future state because they they have to do it for a sense of their own safety or code switching and so there's mm-hmm. lots of different factors that influence the difficulty in so in the performative idea of an identity i totally love that philosophy that it's you know that we can construct ourselves through our thoughts and ideas but 
I totally get the yeah. struggles that that's not, not an sure. easy process. Absolutely. I think we all have those struggles, actually. Um, but it's worth the struggle. Yeah. I think <laughs> it's worth the struggle. <laughs> that's um, the way I get it. <laughs> um, and I mean, but, but my second book is all about the struggle, actually, Keeping with the Spiders. It's all about that. I mean, um, I mean, two major things actually was, um, you know, my first experience of sex and falling in love, actually, um, which was not um, the way society would see things. And in a sense, I shocked myself and struggled through that and suffered greatly through it. And it really put me at odds with my family and my friends and all the rest of it. And had to really, uh, I think, for a long time, live a double life because I couldn't be honest. And that was very, very hard and totally unexpected. That was my, that was a, the other big struggle in my life was my eldest daughter was born um, with a disability, a physical disability. Um, and nobody helped, nobody could help, nobody knew what was going on, nobody could, you know. And the, the, the sense of, I mean, I was uh, very religious at once, very Catholic one time, um, that's very limiting of course, um, suddenly feeling that there was nothing, there was nobody that could help, there was no God, there was nothing. I was completely alone and having to deal with this awful thing at the age of 31, you know, thinking about my little girl, you know. Um, but, I mean, I can read you a passage about that actually because I think this, um, I'm, I'm going to read you that um, if, you, if you'll permit me to do it because I think it's really important. She's now 45, oh no, maybe 43 actually. She wouldn't like it if I said she was 45. <laughs> um, but I'll read you this actually. <clears throat> so, so I, I'll just give you, put you, first of all, in the picture, the way I felt it, so it's called Miracles. There's no God, and this was not, this was not how it was meant to be. There'd been such expectation around, such buoyancy and goodwill, it had gone so well. For the first time, it'd been a pretty good effort. I'd even taken a moment to put on a bit of lipstick before coming through the swing door to re-enter the world. And here I was now, alone in the half-light at 2 a.m., perched on a stool, only room for one, and how I wanted the warm presence of someone else to sit beside me, someone to tell me all would be okay, that God would see us through. I was 31. I'd always thought, you see, that someone somewhere made sure you would be safe, that answers would come, that nothing was for life, that things usually ended well. Please, please listen to me. My bonding with my baby is not in question. I just need someone to help me cope. Please stop observing me as if I'm wanting in some way. Can someone please help us? Tell us what is going to happen. Please, God, make this thing go away. I'm pleading for a miracle. Please give her my legs. Take it all but make her way. And then, my daughter gradually gained the wings of excellence and endurance of trust as well. When I look at the woman she is, the layers of adulthood and maturity fall away, and I see through to the loving, fragile child in her with so much to give and so much to glory in. She's grown to be a good, good person, well loved for her charisma, wit, mind and mischief. In her wake, I've learned a lot. Mostly, I learned humility and was stripped of my precious elitism. Our elegant Alfeta sports car and the middle-class paraphernalia of social contact didn't quite seem to matter anymore. To hell with the dinner parties, the small talk and the garden escalonia. To hell, too, with the badges, the hierarchies and the pomposities, the exclusionary language and practices. The stuff of life is how we react, confront and find ways to deal with what we didn't want or expect, how we recover ourselves, Stay steady through what shatters, terrifies and cuts us down. Travelling those years with her, I too learned lessons that deeply affected and dictated the direction of my own professional life, working on behalf of socially disadvantaged children and people in education, lessons that I preached from the heart and the head ever after. The world is not just for winners. 
not just for the privileged, those born to ready stardom. The challenge is to encourage and cultivate stardom in those around us, to hear diverse voices, to mainstream and not just include them, but to foreground their rich rawness and their diversity. Make them leaders, CEOs, headhunters and recruiters, heads of state policymakers and strategists. Fill schools, hospitals, courts and committee rooms with them. Break down written codes. Remake the fabric with raw, fragile threads. One of the most compelling cellists I ever heard had never been taught and was entirely, heart-stoppingly unformed. And from this, my eldest child, the setter of time, temperature and tide for the entire family, her younger sisters found their own relentless, restless energy, their staunchness, their fierce defence and consideration, how and for others. And so on. So, out of tragedy there comes something else. Um, and uh, I wrote the book just towards the end of the pandemic, and I, I did a bit about the pandemic there too, you know, that um, we were all terrified. But what we all talk about now is how we found joy in those days, in little ways as well. Um, we were, I mean, you know, thousands of people died, we, and we somehow navigated that in the best ways that we could. Um, it, you know, weeping, horrified, frightened, and yet I made good friends with my neighbour over the garden wall in the street. You know, what I mean? just, you know, we, other things came. You know, I can remember my partner turning up, you know, having gone early morning to get me smoked salmon because I was craving smoked salmon, you know, and coming in with that saying, here you are, here's your smoked salmon, you know, ho hopefully I didn't get COVID today. You know, there were, there were, you know, the joys of climbing Blackford Hill, you know, on a Monday morning, you know, um, the joy of not hearing an aeroplane, the joy of seeing a 70-year-old woman skating in the middle of an afternoon on Inverleaf, in Inverleaf Park suddenly just saying to me, oh, this, let me freedom, you know, and people watching. There were joys, too. Um, so my point is, we struggle. We, life is about, life breaks us. But it's how we respond to that, isn't it? It's, well, I mean, what I hear you saying is <clears throat> that being ourselves is not because there aren't obstacles. It's because we find ways of overcoming the obstacles. Mm -hmm. That's right. <clears throat> I found the early days of the lockdown is on March and April 20th incredibly relaxing because the weather was super I could go out and sort of go long walks on my own because you weren't meant to sort of meet up with anyone outside. And I could read you a little more. I mean I've, I've you know um I well I will read you this wee poem actually because this kind of what we were talking about earlier um just a minute ago it's um called Joy the Dancer. She dances in the swish and chatter of leaves in winter sun and wind, and I seek her as I walk the hill to a new city. She dances across a not quite blue sky, somewhere where sea and chance are one. And I, Loch Boysdale bound on a solid ferry, follow her to a black house, see her somewhere on the foreshore, find pink shells. Sometimes she dances on my coffee cup, I walk a crowded street of falsetto and monotone. She stands still briefly, and my memory brings back fresh baked Madeleine, France, and the aroma of melted sugar. She dances in voices, loud laughter and family, in sweet cursing and thick tongues of Italy's south. She pirouettes on jostling plates, red rich with sauce and rough sliced sausages. She dances in the tip and toddle of a baby girl. I see her in a well-loved breath. I can't feel her here. She dances on the tip of a fiddle bowl, flies skywards from gargoyles. She dances in wardrobes, in wools, spangle, and skinnies. I look for her in the mirror. Tomorrow, maybe, she will dance in my new dress. That's just about finding joy, you know, in whatever. Fiddles, my granddaughter, whatever. You know, just finding joy, enjoying the hours. Um, I'm going to finish with um, this. Um, I think uh, what this book is really about, apart from 
It's an evocation of the south of Italy, um, and I've tried to put Italy on the page. Uh, so there's music in it, there's playlists, there's wine recommendations, there's recipes. But actually, more importantly, I think, there's, um, there's a description of a particular way of life. Um, and I've talked about locating self. And um, one of the things I didn't say earlier, but I, I wanted to escape being Italian for a number of reasons, um, which are pretty clear. And also the repression of an Italian family on women in particular, um, uh, you know, and expectations of being a woman, actually. It's, you know, I mean, I, it's called according to my family, I should have <coughs> had a job, you know, that would fit in with my husband, really, and, um, and uh, you know, the children and so on. And I, I wanted the whole cake, not half the cake. Um, and so I had to deal with all of that. So, uh, so I deserted that, and of course I had a, lot, a Scottish name, so I could pretend I wasn't Italian, um, although people tell me it was pretty obvious anyway. But, um, uh, uh, but at the end of it all, at the end of it all, um, I've, and the pandemic did that, I think, for me. I've ultimately embraced that. Um, I've embraced that, that part of me. I emerged from, um, from the pandemic, apart from being a baker, which I never was before, <laughs> um, as, as truly having found something, I think. Um, it was the bottle of olive oil that somebody brought back from Italy made me cry. Um, suddenly seeing it there in the middle of this pandemic, this golden olive oil, the sun shining from my kitchen window, and I, I just felt this need for reality and truth and something solid. So I'm going to read you this. My grandparents came from, from Viticuzzo, which is a small village between Rome and Naples. Viticuzzo, like most villages in the south of Italy and elsewhere, has a patron saint, San Dandonin, who died a martyr in Syria in the Middle Ages. He's honoured every year on the 1st of September, a feast day for which those who have left the village to live elsewhere return in droves. For some, the gathering, which lasts several days, is ostensibly a religious festival. But most people gather there, returning from countries all over the world, to come and to stand together as a community, to meet friends and enjoy family. As one young and old, unite to honour their, at times, savage history. They come together to celebrate their roots in the land that endowed them with the wherewithal to remain and to thrive there, or the talent and skill to establish themselves and make their mark in a wider world, with the strangers they often had to think on their feet in response to changing fortunes. Towns and cities in the south of Italy are often criticised for unproductive economy and slow lifestyle, a way of life which clings to the past. Italian politics are full of polemics and fierce debate about the problems of the South, which are real and pressing, particularly in the wake of the, wake of the pandemic. But as the decades turn, we find ourselves as a society increasingly challenged by world events, those lifestyles and values on which the modern world has been built under closer scrutiny. It seems that in order to go forward, we've begun to grasp, perhaps, the urgency of looking backwards, to research, to recover, to recycle, and to relearn old ways. This book is a series of snapshots and evocations of a particular culture which is still alive today. In Viticuzzo, Viginisco, all the hamlets up and down the southern lands of a country that I'm honoured to call mine, and which I believe has much to teach us. The culture of this still unsung land has much to offer our current times. Respect and love of nature and the land. Delight in a rich harvest, in neighbours, in holding a grandchild, in the aroma of rising dough, in racing clouds, in the blessed rain, in the sun of early rising, in birdsong, working bees and flowering shrubs and trees. Most importantly, an expression of that delight and joy through long lazy hours and days spent with intimates and loved ones at a generous table put together with a pure and open heart. I've spent many years as someone from an immigrant family, trying very hard in many areas of my life, and very often not too successfully, to fit. 
As the months of the pandemic passed, those layers fell away. I felt a new hunger for truth, a need to embrace a part of me that I'd tried to hide and to ignore. Manya Choni, My Food, My Italy, celebrates arrival and it celebrates otherness and difference. It celebrates a breath, precious birthright and like the legacy. It is a joyful recognition of what has been gifted to me, a particular set of values that I'm privileged to have grown up with and that I hope I've laid down for my daughters and those who follow them. So that's, that's the story. Um, but let's talk more about identity <laughs> because I think that's, that's at the heart of all of this. Um, let's talk about it. Very, very, you know, it speaks very powerfully. I, 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 I think for a big part of my life, I was constantly wrestling with the identities other people were telling me mm -hmm. I was. Mm -hmm. I, and could never get it right. Uh, that, that interesting thing. <coughs> If I went to England, I was Scottish, and if I was in Scotland, I was English, you know, and, you know, and, and uh, just it exhaust, psychologically exhausted me, and it, I, I felt, you know, spent, I remember cracking. I and, uh, remember this moment, it was, it was when Peter, Peter too, but come to town and he was doing his, uh, 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 talk, talking about it, uh, his first part of his autobiography. Mm -hmm. And I had been bought a ticket and I went along and I just, I couldn't see colour in the world, if you know yeah, my yeah. expression. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, he was taking questions and I thought, well, what do you do when you hit rock bottom? And the, the whole place I went, I, and I, I, I kind of was drawn to his figure because his figure of grace and elegance, the mm -hmm. blistering yeah. blue eyes, yeah, yeah. Long, so the Lawrence of Arabia, that idea of walking across deserts and just keeping walking, keep going, keep. And, uh, and he paused and he looked up and said, Well, one waits. For, for an opportune moment, and then one gets up. And that was a moment when I started to sort of, start to go, okay, well, I, I don't know who I am. I started to listen and, and search, to seek out mm -hmm. ways of self-discovery. Right. Um, and uh, the, the, the Luci Iroquois, uh, a, a, a philosopher, uh, I, I started to, I, I really identified with her expression of um, distinguishing between whether somebody seeing you as a cipher, mm -hmm. you know, an image they've got in your, their mind of you, mm -hmm. Or whether they're they're seeing you as a human being, and she she says, if you're looking at somebody and have, see a cipher, you're not seeing a human being. If you're seeing a sense of uh, eternal wonder, you know, it's, it's a process of discovery. You're you're if somebody tells you meets you and goes, this is who you are. That's one way that they're engaging with. And then there's another way people go, hello, and then engage you in, who are you? So, and I started to realize, ah, the, the one, one form of, there, there's, a, there's dialogue and then there's something that looks like dialogue. And I really, really have, I feel comfortable in that dialogue, in that mutual discovery yeah. Mutual recognition, and uh, start that that started to immunise me a little bit about the, the 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 labels that you accrue over time, I, and and it, I I got a bit of resilience from from oh well yeah, that's 
that's a that's a that's how somebody is seeing me. They're not taking the time to find out. Um, so yes, the, I still do. Yeah. I'm, I'm still so learning, good. but it's, so, yes. it's, right. it's a pleasure. Yes, that's exciting. Yeah. It's the work in progress. It's work in progress, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But, no, I was, this is going back a little bit, because I'm just thinking about the two different types of identity and this kind of the very individual one where, like you were saying, you're meeting somebody and if they're really connecting with you, they're, they're discovering, they're... they're aware enough out of you and present enough that they're responding to who you are at the time, not who they were expecting you to be. And that, that's kind of what was going through my mind. That they are dealing with your work in progress as a work in progress. Or oh, your improvisation. Yeah, your improvisation. Yeah, and they, they're, but they're open to the curiosity of seeing who you are today, even though that they might have known you for years. But the other, the other part of identity that struck me was about the labels that people put on you, but not necessarily the negative ones. And it was something that I was seeing in your one, which is identity and belonging. Mm -hmm. The link between uh, your identity, but your identity as part of a group, as yeah. kind of being part of belonging. Yeah. The feeling of belonging, yeah. which I got from your Italian. Yeah. Many moons ago, Ray ran a, ran a group called the Los Angeles Psychology Meetup Group. Mm -hmm. And the topic one week was, where do you consider home? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's very much your sort of identity in that most people tend to sort of think, you know, people say, I'm going home for Christmas. Mm -hmm. but where is home? You know, yeah. Is it back to your flat in Edinburgh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it a place or is yes. it a, or a, is it a place or is it people? Or a yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have a concept of where I belong mm -hmm. at all. Uh, so it's really interesting just because, like for me, like right now I really don't know where my home is, is because my parents have become so religious that mm -hmm. they are like, either you come the Christ way mm -hmm. or you leave your own life. So it's like, I know like why they are, mm -hmm. they, why they have become so religious is because my sister was so mm -hmm. unwell and the doctors had given up and then. Mm -hmm. My parents went, to, like my mother went to the church, and she could mm -hmm. see the miracles happening. And then, like I know at like what what's her belief is, mm -hmm. and then she's like so much into Christ now that you know my parents are both like baptized, and like mm -hmm. for me even to talk to them for like it's so difficult to talk to them like five minutes and there is God in the conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like even if even if I date somebody, even if I get married to somebody, they would be like if she is not a Christian, like. You do your own life. It's, so it's, 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 it's really yeah. hard. Like I have to go home in like mm -hmm. a few weeks and my degree at Oxford is over. Mm -hmm. But is it really my home? Because I might come back in three days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because yeah. I already put a US visa. So yeah. Yeah. I know. So I think that's definitely not a one day session. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> Where home is it? Yeah. yeah. Very difficult. It's very Where difficult. were you raised? Uh, I'm, I was raised in India. In India. In India. And I've, I've, like this, I've come to England for my degree at Oxford. And you know, there's an interesting thing you said, you, you said it before you came to England, you know, it's Britain, you know, in that you mentioned there, the, when you were in, in England, you were Scottish. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you're, you know, you, you, Alex said, you were in Scotland, you're English. <laughs> you become um, English. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and nobody says they're British. Yeah. Yeah. So in group, group, like there's a, 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 a Greek myth story that I, I really cherish. Um, oh, sorry. I the, the story of Bacchus and Philemon. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a myth about Xenia. Um, the, um, and it very much speaks to hospitality because, you know, as for a certain part of my my life, I, I was drifting, really homeless, and and what I so what I discovered was that philanthropy is not a myth. For me, it's very very much a reality because I discovered it in strangers. Mm -hmm. I, I witnessed it, and the story of Orcus and Philemon is so. Uh, 
uh, you know, very rudimentary version of it is uh, Zeus has thrown a hissy fit mm -hmm. and gone, oh, all right, this is all, uh, all not how I had planned it, and I'm going to wipe out humanity and start again. You know, storms and floods and all of that jazz. <coughs> Before, before I do that, I, I will go down uh, to Earth and I'll take a walk. And he disguised himself as a, a, a beggar, a homeless beggar, and came across this couple, Marcus and Philip. Mm -hmm. And they saw, oh, you look cold, come in, come into the house. I sit by the fire. And, oh, you look hungry. And, is there any food? And they, they go to, to and they, they go to kill their, their only goose. And at that moment, he goes, aha, well, and he reveals himself as Zeus. And he says, ah, you've just shown me the reason why it is, you know, why, why it, there is perfection here. And in that, uh, I thank you. So I'll, I'll grant you a wish. And at the same time, they, they, they said, oh, well, when, when they die, I'd like to go too. And so he granted their wish. And when they died, they were transformed into trees, mm -hmm. the oak and linden tree. Mm -hmm. And they grew and twined. So you'll see these pictures depicting that. And what I, I draw from that is that it, it's the humanity Mm -hmm. It's yeah. the care. Yeah. It, it's the love. It's the love of another, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. that that yeah, it, it, that's the the wild space for me mm -hmm. that that sustains mm -hmm. life and all the things that keep us going. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's very true. Yeah. Yes, and belief in you. Um, I mean, one of the things that um, really kept the students. I mean, helped the students that. I, researched mm -hmm. was the, the, the belief, the obvious belief in them and their, what they had to offer that the lecture conveyed. That was really important, actually. You know, and it, it's, it's, it's a true thing. Um, as my own experience, I played in an orchestra for a, a small absolute orchestra for about eight years and no one ever said boo. And actually nobody even noticed if I wasn't there. And then I joined a band um, about six months ago and everybody says, you play the mandolin so beautifully. And because people say that, mm -hmm. you do play well. You know, it is, it's a fun, so, you know, that it's belief in somebody and expressing that belief and appreciation is a really important thing in education in a classroom, actually, that there's a nurturing as well. Um, or your children or your friends, that nurturing really important, yeah. actually. It's a kind of a type of mirroring, whether it's mirroring back to you, and you're getting you're getting something coming back from the real world. Yeah. So it isn't just living That's in right. your head it, where you can doubt it or something That's you right. are getting that kind That's of right. well evidence. Yeah. From next time. Yeah. That's right. Next Absolutely. That's a true. Bit validation. Sure. Not and only do you play, you, are you trying to play well? You're getting a lot. You're getting satisfaction from what you're doing. It. Yeah. But Which more, is good for your your own own right. self esteem, is it? That's true, but I think it's it's more about um, I'm probably playing the same. Mm -hmm. It's just that you know I'm appreciate you know it's, mm -hmm. and I, I th you see that you yeah. see that in many situations. Yeah, actually. you do, and you get this extra layer of meaning to it. Yeah. If it's just you know if it's a painting you've done and it just lives under your bed, there's an extra layer of meaning if it gets shown and if somebody wants it, I, and you might. You know, it's true. It's true. not necessarily sell it for the money, but sell it to get it out there in the world because yeah. that adds to the meaning. That's true. Yeah. How do you embrace that vulnerability then? Because, like, obviously, if you're putting something out there and doing mm -hmm. something, there's always the risk that it won't meet this sort of creative interaction. I think mm -hmm. was the word you used of like, and it will mm -hmm. just be an isolating experience, and you have to find that. Is it just bravery? Mm -hmm. or? I think you can. I, I can oh, sorry, <laughs> I think you, you can take them off, but you're kind of satisfied in the idea that you've done it. Mm -hmm. Which, even if nobody likes it, nobody sees it. I mean, just talking for myself now, I I get a satisfaction of 
out of just having done it, out of having taken the risk, you know, I can kind of pat myself on the back for that one. Do you have a project in mind? <laughs> what did you say? I've seen you had a project in mind. Oh, I see. We did on the day, but you're amongst friends. So all I get. I think it's hard to embrace that vulnerability. Yeah, because I, I think mean, there's a lot in this yeah. of that sort of yeah. that almost that battle and sort of reaction and interaction between like belonging and then the self creating and mm. risking sort of mm. where you belong mm. and confronting. Yeah going against people's expectations that can be potentially isolating. Yeah. Right, I think but the thing I always remember <clears throat> is the Carol Dweck stuff from psychology about the fixed versus the growth model. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, the notion that you, know, you put something out there and it doesn't work and you think, well, that's it. Never going to be any good. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, people are not accepting it. I've made a mistake. It's a failure. And that's the fixed model. But the growth model says, what did I learn from doing that? How am I going to be able to do something a bit better the next time? How am I going to be near success in the future? And I think that's the difference. You, know, you don't see the, 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 the failure as the end of the story. You see that as the beginning of a new story and the opportunity to go on and grow from that. Yeah. I guess it's different if you're actually creating something and you're putting your creation out there as opposed to a vulnerability where you're actually putting yourself out there. Yeah. I think that's a, probably a bit more yeah. but it's it's risky. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be a piece of work. It could yeah. be a quip or mm-hmm. something. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, it's all kind of creativity, aren't there? Yeah. I always remember you saying, if, "If you've never made a mistake, you haven't been trying hard enough." <laughs> <laughs> Back in the early sixties, there were these four guys called John, Paul, George, and Ringo, <laughs> <laughs> as as individuals who were actually good musicians, but they wouldn't have got anywhere on that. But when they got together as a group. Mm-hmm. Playing together and, and writing music together, they were wonderful mm-hmm. and became f- the Fab Four. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah that's true. Yeah. So if they never, if they'd never gone out of their houses, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, cl- cl- you're talking about collaboration, right? And collaboration, all of that. That's really, really important. Actually, to create something together. So, so like, so Ragged University as an idea was was a has has been a a space where uh, it, I was looking for a space that was friendly, warm, and, and to to be able to share and to be able to share in safe ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and going from from the this, this <laughs> situation of never having spoken in front of people at all, like I was absolutely terrified of everything. And and then discovering, oh wait a minute, oh right, people who people who come well, are interesting and interested and want to hear and discover and uh, and now I, I don't have that fear. Mm. Uh, from a very physiological response, I I could feel my heart beating in my throat, and you know my you know, almost my hearing went yeah. and dry mouth, and going and realizing it's not okay. I'm going to share this, and it's really it's really nice to have critical friends, mm-hmm. you know, people who have. It's a place for learning, and it's a, it, uh, and repelling away from this idea of monetizing. <laughs> and, you know, Ray, you've got the expression, it's, it's not about the money. Money's not the issue. It's mm-hmm. what my wife and myself talk about very right mm-hmm. mm-hmm. It's not having the money, it's what you choose to do with it. Mm-hmm. 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 When I did my undergraduate degree, um, there was a small, sort of small group of us who, probably three or four, who sort of had similar sort of interests in, in, in the modules we were doing. Um, but at that time, I was you know, in, even though in some, some things like microprocessors and digital electronics and logic, I was, I was the, probably the best. Um, I was never very forthcoming to them at, at tutorials and things like that. Um, it was very competitive, 
I saw them as being competitors to get, you know, to get into sort of the, the top sort of grouping of the, the degree at the end. That was in contrast to when I did my postgraduate MBA, whereas I've got a really good friend um, from Germany and we worked together um, because um, but language is not my, my strongest subject. So doing a splitting assignments, he, he speaks five languages fluently with you can stop sort of mid sentence at the end of one sentence and then start from one language to start another. He's got fluent German, his wife's Italian, so he speaks fluent Italian um, from Milan, so the north. Um, and his wife was working with a French bank, so he speaks French and Spanish because Spanish and Italian are very similar. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when he came to Edinburgh, um, his English was, wasn't perfect. Um, he'd done it from school, um, but with a sort of German sort of, sort of dialect, dialect. So I helped him on that side. And he helped me sort of in writing sort of sentences. He, taught, he taught, taught, taught me in how to, you know, if, I had trouble might be expressing what I wanted to sort of say, and he would sort of help me to put the skeleton together of the mm -hmm. sentence or paragraph, and um, get it done. Mm -hmm. um, and we're now at super friends. Mm -hmm. During the pandemic, we spoke. We um, he was he was the chief operating officer of a bank in Dusseldorf, mm -hmm. and because af after he did his MBA, he did a part-time PhD and he stayed with me in Edinburgh mm -hmm. during that and we became really good friends during the pandemic and we spoke every Sunday and because he wasn't able to get a job because jobs like that, executive jobs like that in Germany are, have a three-year contract and he got into the shortlist for, for lots of new roles but not one he couldn't do face-to-face -face interviews. Mm. I'm sure he had the time to speak. Mm. And since the pandemic so ended, he's, he's got a job. He's, he's now chief operating officer of one of Germany's biggest banks. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's your, there's your yeah. job. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And, and we sort of have a great rapport sort of talking. Mm -hmm. He's got three children and his oldest boy has just completed a degree at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, two two boys are super footballers. One got a full a goalkeeper scholarship, hundred percent scholarship to to the University of Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. and um, and the second boy, the next boy, is doing a, a degree called business engineering at Darms Technical University of Darmstadt, which is the sort of place that in Scotland we got. We got rid of you know, places like Napier called Napier Polytechnic, yeah. which yeah. was a, a you know a sort of uh, an establishment where you did the theory and then you went out and block release to do yeah. practical bit. And Paisley College of Technology was similar. Sure. I think these were terrible. I, I've I've been going through um, lots of thinking recently in my head as to ed education, you know, my own sort of things. Should you? Do something and then go back and learn the theory, or should you sort of do the theory and then do the practical bit? Mm -hmm. What have you found with that? Sorry? People coming back after learning the theory after they've had the experience. I think um, it's interesting. I think it's quite good to have the experience and then consolidate it with theory. I would, I would have. Mm -hmm. I would have I, I was going to say, actually, in terms of impermanence, I brought a few uh, copies of this. I photocopied some stuff on it. If you're interested in reading about impermanence, um, then you can help yourselves to that, actually. Just a, a wee present. <laughs> um, <coughs> when you started the talk, you were talking about some educational models. Yeah. And one of the early ones you mentioned, if you, I was just thinking about how we come to navigate uncertainty in the construction of identity. Yep. You talked about like children coming with higher values and then in a way education 
it, yeah. it poses other values which are less valuable, like play and exploration and yeah. learning from failure. Yeah. And uh, who was the practitioner for that, that was represented? You mentioned someone's name. Right? Um, I mentioned Foucault as uh, uh, yeah, Foucault. who who basically says that um, society's values um, permeate um, how we educate our children and what we educate them with. And actually, you can look at that. You can look at various curricula and analyze it. You know that way. You can see that. I mean, I was terribly conscious. I, I mean, I, I suppose I have of always been a bit subversive, you know, because I I always felt that there was a middle class value system running through education establishments. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I, I think that it's, I think it's still the case, actually. Well, I, I've been out of it for a while, obviously. Um, but I think what we hold dear as things that are, we think are worth learning um, are questionable, actually. Um, I mean, it was A.S. Neil that wrote Summerhill, wasn't it? That basically you form you form a curriculum according to what the young people want, which I think is a very interesting model, actually, as opposed to saying, this is the French syllabus for the year. We're all going to learn mm -hmm. about how you, you know, the word for Hoover and the yeah. word for... This is what you include and this is what you exactly. out. I mean, it's yeah. a very interesting study, and I don't know if there's enough been done about it, really. Do you think there's too much comfort in the sort of learning system and not enough of this embracing the discomfort and the uncertainty and the sort of unknown elements? Mm -hmm. And like actually to improve learning, it's about making this discomfort comfortable so people are curious and exploratory. And how would you think you go about that, making the uncomfortable comfortable? I think one of the main things to do is to let people understand that if they fall flat on their face, you'll, you'll help them get up again. Mm -hmm. Actually. My wife is Chinese, and one of the things that fascinates me is the differences between the Chinese education system and the education system here, because you're talking to her about what life was like for her when she was being educated. It was about learning to say the right thing. Mm -hmm. it was about, you know, there are set things you are supposed to say, there are set facts you're supposed to accept, and your job is to learn and repeat these. Mm -hmm which was you know, very limiting. In fact, China has suffered a bit as a yes. result of that because it's lacked innovation in terms of industrial development and theoretical development because people only learned what they were told to learn and that was yeah. it. But so it reminded me of my own school days. I was at school in Glasgow in the 1950s and I went to a very authoritarian school. And I learned two major things. One was to be very suspicious of authority. And the other one was how to beat the system. <laughs> but it was a selective school, uh, and it's it what in the United States is a grand aided school. It was sort of halfway between being a public school and a yeah. private school, uh, grand aided school. And the result was that you know a lot of the kids there uh, were actually pretty intelligent kids because they'd been selected. And the major education took place when we were waiting for school assembly in the morning. And we would all sit discussing world affairs and what had been in the news and what we'd been doing and you know, what was going on around about us. Yeah. And the main thing we learned there was to think. Okay. Uh, and that was perhaps actually the most valuable mm -hmm. lesson from the school at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's also certain privileges when it comes to the self actualization. You know, you think of that as a higher need yep. if you're more fun fundamentally we see the news now mm -hmm. london trying to remove tents from homeless people etc yeah. if you're in a situation where you're worried about where you're going to be sleeping it's yeah. going to be a different degrees of actualization isn't yeah. it absolutely absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and you have to look at the you know you have to question the freedom there is in that actually I liked what uh, I, I was reading about Maria Montessori. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And she made a particular point in emphasizing that her schools were Casa di Bambina homes. They're not buildings in which 
children are being educated. Mm -hmm. they, they needed to be environments where people felt they belonged and that they were warm. Whereas partnership by her impulse yep. was to, to nurture a lot of the latch, latchkey children who were didn't have a place and so were running, you know, effectively homeless for the day. Yeah. Um, so she and she, um, I'm in uh, that, that, so that's really flavoured how I, I I think about the the structures we're creating in our world. Yeah. So, uh, I I felt I I do feel we're societally here. You know, uh, my my cultural context. A lot of people are were struggling with depersonalized structures, structures that don't allow people to really <coughs> do the have the social interactions mm -hmm. that are really ancient, and and that's that's a big big reason why food is at the center of writing. You know, and it realized, oh well, since dawn of time, people have come together. You, you know, there's a particular, we, we belong with food, and it's a sharing place. So I like to, to, to have that potlatch idea. Mm -hmm. Talking my language, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, 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 the, in the early days, you know, humans had to sort of learn to communicate so they could all together, you know, um, organise themselves to chase the mammoth over the cliff. Mm -hmm. And then when it fell, when it was dead at the bottom, get together to, to carve it up. Mm -hmm. In Italian homes, I mean, I say that, you know, food, food is the centre, the, mm -hmm. the kitchen table is the centre mm -hmm. of the, the home. No, I was actually going to say, though, Alex, that um, I've done a lot of staff development for lecturers and for teachers, and the message I've always tried to put over is that you are, as a lecturer or teacher, one of a community. You're in partnership with your learners. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that, and that to, to kind of de, uh, what's the word I'm looking, deconstruct that whole notion of I am the subject expert in this room, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and just say, sit down alongside your learners and work with them. And they find that very hard, actually. <laughs> But there was, a, there was a great missionary called Jean Ruddock who, who started all that kind of thinking for me. And she, she said, um, she, she's dead now, she's a superwoman. She was teaching at Cambridge University. And she, she quoted a, a wee girl of eight who said, my teacher has the courage to sit down beside me. And I thought that was terribly telling. Actually, really important. Yeah. You're not the subject expert. You know, you, you, or you, you, you're the expert. You're the expert in terms of communication. You should be the expert communicator, the expert enabler, the expert facilitator. But in terms of subject expert, knowledge changes so fast, actually. And the other thing is, admit you don't know. Just mm -hmm. say you don't know it. Tell the kids to go and look it up. You look it up too, and then come back. Say this is what we found. You know. But in, the, in some ways, you've got to sort of understand the reason why um, you're learning something. Mm -hmm. So we tell, say that uh, your education is about teaching people how to look, but not telling them what to say. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Throwing, like inverting the what I what I experienced as the formal educational system. And going well, okay. What what happens when you just invite the world into a room, and, and the world presents you the curriculum, and you they don't don't say well, right? You have to speak for this long, and you've got to do this way, and you know, create a series of prescriptions and rules, mm. and and that that sort of empties a space of all of these. These uh, these parts of us, yeah. uh, and yeah. and what what fills me with with 
the joy, you know, re reconstituted me. Mm -hmm. Was discovering lots and lots and lots of people throughout life who who are um, interested in a friendly way. And it makes me think about I, I, I puzzle over utopia. Mm -hmm. So the root of that word, not a place. Mm -hmm. And I have come, I, I, I sort of meditated, oh, well, it's not a place. It's people, it's relationships. Mm -hmm. Rabindranath Tagore spoke about all I need is the shade of a tree to start my school in. That's another thing that mm -hmm. made me go, oh, yeah, oh, it's people. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as a yeah. sort of, half feral collie dog myself, <laughs> being adopted at one point by a group of croupiers. <laughs> that sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. I think also at a, at a pedagogical level, uh, this entire idea of question, you know, like the way we are sort of grown up is that your question should be crisp and your question should be clear. Mm -hmm. And that's like an oxymoron because it's a question. I mean, yeah. I understand. I mean, obviously, I understand there's time constraint and, you know, there's this X, Y, Z is working. But it's just this entire practice of, you know, making children practice, like, how to question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's is so regimental. Yeah. Because if, now, I, like, if I knew, I wouldn't be asking. <laughs> yeah. and it's about, like, because I, I go back to my school days and my university days. It's more like, you know, questions should be, like, 30 seconds. It should be oh, crazy. No, no, no. And I was like, <laughs> that's not a question. No, no, no. So, I mean, it is. And, and on the other side, like you were saying, for teaching, when you when you do have a group and and you're learning from your learners, I, it 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 broadens the entire topics. You're enthused. Yes. I mean, there's nothing more valuable in a group that you're teaching than a student who has noticed a hole in something. Yeah. Oh, that's just, that's a gem. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because they, they're they not just receiving their contributors. It's fantastic. Yeah. And some topics move so quickly as well. That yeah. their collective mind is, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 they're, they're actually moving the, the teachers ahead. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. They're driving it. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Yeah. Another thing I've, I've learned is, is I, I've learned a nice way of learning is learning through helping. Mm -hmm. So putting it out into the world can be helpful, e even yeah. with a pair of hands. Um, you know, I so like putting out chairs, sweeping up, helping uh, a lovely, lovely gent called. Uh, Roy Gervich, uh, just, I, how do you put on events? And I learned so much through helping. And I got a, a friendship to boot. And uh, so somebody taught me how to create websites. And he said, well, I'll build you a website. And that's for the community. And it's, that's a proviso. So you share what I've given to you. So since doing that, it's it's a, it's a pleasant and gentle way to be in the world. And uh, yeah, you, you, you end up doing something constructive. And because you're adding an ingredient to, to a cook, a collective recipe, you know, you, you end up, all oh, right, uh, this is how they, this is all the world of experience they're bringing to what, what they're doing. Okay, I, they, they may not do web development, I can do that. So it's, and it, it, it removes a really exclusionary principle, which is finance. Finance really up, upsets all of these mm -hmm. dynamics, mm -hmm. realities. So. It's a fixed, it has to put a fixed value on it right. as well. So, you know, there's this kind of relative, it's, it's not based on need anymore, it's kind of, if I need this, you need that. Ah, but my thing's more expensive. So, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. That's right. 
It's market value. Mm -hmm. and, and something fixed, trying to define it and define the value. How do you define an emergent reality? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, put in a shoebox. <laughs> oh, well, what, what, what's this outside of the shoebox? And you find everything else. I think, going back to one of the terms that I feel you used that a lot so much, which was the play, delight, and uncertainty, you know, as a value going back again to what children are very good at. Mm -hmm. In your inexpensive uncertainty, the play is a fantastic means of navigation where there's no map. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. And I mean, it, children, children playing, going back to your, your um, idea of remaking and, you know, reinventing your reality or your identity all the time. If you look at children playing, they're, they're inventing, mm -hmm. they're taking bits and pieces of what they've learned, what they've seen on TV, mm -hmm. you know, what somebody's, hope, what they've overheard. And they're making a reality out of it. And it changes all the time. And so it goes, no, I don't want it to be that. I don't want that to be reality. Okay, okay, we'll change it. <laughs> you know? And the use of imagination. Yeah. Really yeah. important. Yeah. 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 To allow that yeah. to flourish. That, yeah. yeah. That's imagination. Yes. One of the things that um, the people I did a case study on came up with, actually, I thought was very interesting. You know, why... What, what's the most valuable thing you've got from your learning experience? And it wasn't the qualification. They've come for the qualification. What was the most valuable thing was the relationships that they built during the learning experience. And I thought that was very interesting, actually. And, and also going to identity. I mean, the cynical one is you learn the attitude. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, Depending on what kind of school you go to, what was the most valuable thing you came out with? Attitude. Um, but it's also, it's the con confidence. Yeah, that's right. Self confidence. There was, the, there was from one of the RSA talks, one of your friends who um, was a Glasgow based organization that was based on that kind of inner voice of the. Uh, if you have an idea and then the cinema voice says, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. But it was a very Scottish thing as well, that he, he was encountering so many creative young people and he created the organisation based on that uh, inner voice that just says no. It's not Ken Robinson. No, no, it was a friend from, the, from your RSA, friend who right. was based in Glasgow. Oh. Um, but it was that kind of reminded me a little bit what you were saying before about having the courage to put an idea out mm -hmm. and then there's a cultural Scottish like way of thinking which is like oh but that would never work <laughs> something like that and then so then oh, are you getting above yourself that yeah or <laughs> yeah standing above your station mm -hmm. or something so how do you so his whole thing was supporting more marginalised or underprivileged communities to be having that confidence to express a belief or the courage to fail through mm -hmm. testing or whatever that might be, mm -hmm. but just that. But it was a really catchy title, I can't remember what it was. Something. Wasn't Roxanne Purcell, was it? I don't know. She does lots of really right. great stuff on uh, learning through failure. Right. And she, she sort of goes, well, if you've not you know, got something wrong, you're not trying hard yeah. enough. And one of her things was, well, yeah, it's it's... It's problematic to penalise people. You, mm -hmm. you, you've got this one shot, mm -hmm. and this is the grade that will determine all these opportunities. That's and right. These dominoes start toppling mm -hmm. people's lives, right. and then suddenly, like algorithms are reading CVs, mm -hmm. and and you're the. <coughs> What, what what's happened to the culture of people being told, all right, well, come on, have a have a shot, and we'll we'll work yeah. with you. Um, like it's, it's in learning and training, seeing this in training, doing a role play or something, you know, for adults in a professional context, training should be is, is the safe place for them to fail. Mm. Like school is the safe place That's for right. you to fail because it's going to have uh, much greater consequences outside. So yeah. this is the time to try it. 
I mean, the abomination is league tables. Mm -hmm. An absolute abomination. And I mean, you know, unthinking head teachers work to them, you know, and impose, they impose that on their staff because, you know, that's the way, that's the way success is recognised, actually. They impose working to get, you know, to, like, children, if you think a child's going to fail uh, an exam, a public exam, then don't present them. Yeah. yeah. Because if you present them, it'll impact badly on the league yeah. tables, and that's our position, and that's our status in, in, the, in the world, and all of that, you know. Yet they're an abomination, and what they don't do is measure, and this is a very important concept in education, distance travelled. Mm-hmm. And that, that's an, that really is important because you, you, it, it's not everybody getting to that point. It's about where people start from, actually. So this guy starts there and gets to there, fine. This guy starts from there, he might not get to there. He might get just to there. And that's important. He's made progress. That's success. But that's not measured. No, it must be horrible. Uh, you know, talk about the influence of uh, culture on identity for the children coming out from the schools who are at the bottom. Yeah. And what that's going to, yeah. what that's going to do to their self-image. Well, you've got kids. I mean, I've been on children's panel. I mean, they're terrible. Some children are born in terrible, terrible circumstances. Mm. Drug dealers at the door. Mm-hmm. Children. There's abuse going on. There's sexual abuse. There's domestic abuse. You know, and they 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 emerge from that, and they're lucky to get to school, even to make it to school. You know, so that's in a sense it's an uneven playing field. You've got the other guy coming from a nice place like Brunsfield and Morningside with a clean uniform, and he comes nicely showered to school, having had his breakfast. You know? So it's about trying to. Everyone's entitled to, you know, to. To, to, to education, but it's about allowing for measuring the success or recognising the success of the other kids, actually, who've come from quite a different scenario altogether. That was one positive outcome, I think, from the independent peer review, the higher education, there was different dialogue happening around the difference between um, equity and equality mm-hmm. when it comes to access um, yeah. requirements. And, for girls, yeah. it's how you define education in the first place. I mean, I had a friend who did very badly at school. We were never very academic at all. And we were seen as being, to some extent, an academic failure because that was the criterion by which he decided whether he was educated or not, whether he'd passed the exams, whether he'd done well at school. But he decided, actually, he was going to drop out of school earlier and went and became a plumber's apprentice. And 30 years later, he was running a very successful plumbing business, making more than I did, <laughs> and, and really enjoying life. He yeah. said, well, you know, which was his education? Yeah. Was it what happened in school, mm-hmm. or was it learning to be a plumber? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. If Jacob, Jacob Rees-Walk would say, you're not educated if you can't read Latin mm-hmm. or speak Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. And other essential <laughs> skills. <laughs> yeah. Can someone do away with these people, please? <laughs> What's interesting, I, I find, is that you know, children, they start off being incredibly interested in learning, learning everything, but they get to about 10 years old and suddenly they sort of rebel against learning. I sort of, I sort of try to work out myself. You know, they come home for homework. Uh, on 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 the, the arithmetic and mathematics, and they show it to Daddy, and Daddy says, "Sorry, I wouldn't mean, worry about this. I've never had, I never had, I never, I never did any of that." And look where it's got me. And and this is the other thing you sort of mentioned that you know, in that there's all these sort. Of, Things talked about about poverty areas, with children in poverty. Yes, I don't really know what poverty is. I was brought up in the countryside. We never had a television. We only got a television when my mum said, "If you pass all your O levels, we'll get a TV." I think poverty is for children who can't get a meal, a square mm. meal. Actually, 
which is very, I mean, Scotland's got very, very, very high poverty level. Child poverty is very, very bad in Scotland. Is it? that because the parents can't cook? Because they were taught to cook at school? It's a number of factors. It's a number of factors. It's housing, it's yeah. crime rate, it's... Mm -hmm. Scottish index of multiple, de multiple deprivation. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, when we, I was living in uh, the high rise blocks in Oxcanks mm -hmm. uh, to the south of the city. And um, I mean, personally, I, I felt it was one of the richest moments of my life because I, I found so many lovely and brilliant minds. Um, but I remember being asked. Uh, to, Oh, Alex, would you? I've got this great idea for a let system, local enterprise token system, a local currency, and I've you know built these machines and people can get cards and build up credits. And if you can install it in your locale, you know, you, you know you you're a part of the community. I have to say, you don't get it. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere to install. There's a bookies, there's a chippy, hmm. there's a pub, there's a, a post office, there's a corner shop. But there'll be a, beauty, a few beauty salons. <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at the time, you know, there, there was nothing, everything yeah. had been, and I'm looking at the, the planning documents that go back to the 1920s. Uh, you know, Craig Miller and Nidri, and they were described as these visions of Patrick Geddes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, <laughs> uh, gardens, the uh, gardens. Fam famous as a town planner mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, quite a holistic thinker. Mm -hmm. and I've, I've been to, tuning into uh, academics who, who really know the, the vision of Gaddis and asking them, could you look at uh, Craig Miller and tell me what you think is this <laughs> the vision? And the, no, it, this is these are entirely denuded, economically denuded spaces. Yeah, yeah. Right. and also also the the work of uh, Professor Ray Oldenburg really interesting, um, who. Uh, his work in the States, he was looking at what makes a locale uh, a habitat, if you like. Yeah. Right? And, and he spoke about the great good places. Uh, cafes, pubs, uh, well, small businesses also, group shops, but they can be take lots of different forms and they're places where People meet yeah. and chew the cud yeah. and swap stories, interact. You meet old friends, you discover new friends. Mm -hmm. There's often cheap, affordable food involved. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, his work yeah. really, I think, is it, it, yet is only becoming more pertinent. This is where people linger. Places where people. Oh, sorry, it just it just yeah. came to my head. It's places where people linger. Beauty salons, barber shops, yeah. um, cafes, yeah. as opposed to like the corner shop, go in, buy out. You know that kind of thing. Yeah. Edinburgh is a city made up of lots of villages which mm -hmm. were connected together by a, a railway station mm -hmm. on a line or a tram line. Trams were all ripped up, tram lines were all ripped up because they were considered old fashioned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but each of these villages sort of had a heart, you know, sort of had a which is bigger candles that yeah. make a sort of soup. Yeah. I just and, and they also, coming. most of them actually had a, somewhere was called a manufacturing, which was a factory producing something, mm -hmm. making things. I mean, we don't have that nowadays. I'm just wondering whether that neighbourhood thing is coming back, though. Um, well, there's an intention that it should, mm -hmm. because you talk about 15-minute city. Mm -hmm. The idea is that everything that you want should be within 15 minutes walk of where you live. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and part of that with the idea of cutting down things like car transport and yes. so on as well. But, 
Well, that's going to work or not remains to be seen. We can turn an enormous move backwards in the new special mm -hmm. mm -hmm. people's lifestyle. There's, there's so much that you can control. I mean, you can, I mean, I've seen it in my neighborhood. You could have introduced it there, but then this shop goes under, and the people, you know, <laughs> what, do I, what do I have now? Um, the pub closed, and now there's somewhere that makes dentures. You know, and you don't linger <laughs> there. No. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you don't meet your friends there. Um, I never thought about when they were... When they we close and something else comes in. So the planning only goes so far. Mm -hmm. Is there any examples of those micro-currencies functioning and working? I've heard that the Bristol pound is still pretty strong. Um, it's sort of minor for a little bit, and you used to be able to use it on buses and stuff, but they've cut away with that and everything. So I think it's sort of, yeah, had a short, sharp blast in the sun, but I don't think it's Some particularly the, big anymore. The less things, I don't know if Let's is still going. Yeah, I, I, I know that there, I, I, there was one example which really made it quite strong to the point where the treasury got involved and went, well, if we can't tax it, you're not allowed to do it. Oh, mm -hmm. right. Which was that one? I, right. I would have to, I would have to check it out. Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, was, yeah, I, I, uh, well, it, uh, friends of mine in Finhorn, um, they were trying it and the trouble is with the let's, you don't get you don't get the breadth of um, services and trade. So there are lots of massage, no plumbing. <laughs> you know, it's basic. And so there were lots of people putting things up, but the, the, mm. the, the services that they might have needed and wanted to trade for were a bit thin on the ground. I spent some time on an off-grid community uh, there's no road there, no electrical infrastructure, no pumps, no pumps, no shops. And before I was helping out on small organic farms, and before I went, I just conceptually couldn't understand. How, so how how do people live? How does? Uh, and I went there for for four weeks. And I went. I wound up staying nine months because people sort of went, "Oh well, oh you're you're being helpful. Why don't you come over and help over here? Mm -hmm. Why don't we do biodynamics?" And and it was just being helpful. And what was really interesting was when one place had a glut of something, like things, they would just go around and go, mm -hmm. "Well, got loads of tomatoes mm -hmm. here." And uh, um, friend Bill described it was fairly people self-organize. Mm. Right, we're doing a beach cleanup, <laughs> so everybody would be invited, and it would go right. Okay, well, some people would gravitate towards the wood. Some people would pick up the plastic, mm -hmm. and then you know everybody gravitated. And, and people then saw what was left to be done. And even if they weren't close-knit friends, or you know, didn't have a strong friendship bond, there was just this understanding, well, you know, we do it. Live and let live. And that, that really reconfigured my, my understanding of how how humans, as social mammals, mm -hmm. can do naturally uh, coordinate. Mm -hmm. There's so groups called men sheds around which do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. The people with very skills sort of come together and mm -hmm. um, do things in the community for people. Mm -hmm. It's to encourage men to talk to one another. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which they don't do so easily. Mm -hmm. I remember shocking an audience. Uh, I, I, it was a, a BERA event, uh, a British Education Research Association, uh -huh. uh, and I, I, my my part in this panel was I just addressed the audience and I said, "Look, I'm flat broke, <laughs> but 
what I can do is maybe be helpful. Okay. And let's remove the paperwork, remove the money. I'll just, if you've got a website that you need built, I'll do it for free. But the shock that I was met with, but, and, and I think it was more completely out of fr outside the frame of reference of such a highly regulated yeah. space where you've got internal currencies going on in, in universities and, and I've been finding, well, um, oh, educators have to budget to rent rooms in their own institutions, they have to budget to get tea and coffee and, you know, and, and I, I, I learned to not try, try not to speak to the institution, but talk to the individual educators. And that's, I, I, we're, we're caught, sometimes caught in administrative structures. Yes. So, you know, this, uh, I mean, the trouble is that education has become politicised and commercialised. Mm -hmm. Universities in particular, I, I was interested in some of the statistics this week, which were saying that a quarter of all the new housing that's been built in Edinburgh has been built for students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That doesn't surprise me at all. Despite the fact that Edinburgh has a, a housing crisis. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. because the international students paying 30 grand a year for their mm -hmm. education. Yeah, actually. Exactly. And, and you can rent it out as an Airbnb for the festival. I'm not in between that. terms. I'm sorry, that's cynical, but that, that's what I've heard of a cynical great plan. <laughs> you get a tax break for building it as student accommodation, and after 10 years, you can actually sell it on as proper accommodation mm -hmm. and make a profit. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you know, I mean, when I think back to universities, when I went to university, it was a very different institution. Oh, completely. Uh, it was very much about education, it was about, uh, you know, understanding things, it was about creating new ideas. Now it's about turning out people with a degree, because if you don't turn them out with a degree, they're going to complain you didn't get the money's worth. It's a degree factor. I've never, I mean, I, I always had a vision of, you know, when I was at university, you know, impoverished students, you know, kind of living, you know, in some kind of damp, smelly attic, you know, and, you know, kind of really struggling for money. But actually, I go to the university library very often, and I see really designer-dressed students, actually, mm -hmm. very, very well-dressed. Um, lots of money because you know the, the university are you know really happy you producing all these bloody accountants and lawyers mm -hmm. who produce sort of <laughs> I've thrived from the the, the th so in, in Edinburgh of course you've got these big influxes and I, I love the interculturalism mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, yeah it's that, really important I, yeah but what I really realised was <laughs> As intakes of students came and then went, all of these textbooks would be either put in the bin or, or given to charity shops. And the charity shops would pump them because they wouldn't have resale value. So I clocked this and I just started spin diving. Going, oh, I'll have a bit of pharmacology, a bit of law, a bit of history. <laughs> You know, you know, some things. These things, uh, they're, they're, they're extortionate to buy. Yeah. I've, I've got a room in my house which is every single book I've bought in my life is in that room. And I've still got my university notes. And my, you know, my sister sort of said, you know, Andrew, you keep most of your stuff in your house is junk. I said, no, it's actually valuable. She said, you know, all these bloody books, she put them in the charity shop because it's not all in, on the internet. I say, but you can't go and get this book, which talks about um, internet protocol in one book. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of first edition of it. You know. you know, when I graduated from university in 1977, the internet didn't exist. And the idea of having a mobile phone the size of it is just now with about five or six radios in it. Um, what's pie in the sky or sort of thing. You might see in Star Trek mm -hmm. if it was on the TV then. Because radios were the size of your backpack. Mm -hmm. 
but it's interesting because uh, just recently <clears throat> I was trying to clear out what rubbish uh, I've got journals from my profession going back to 1975. I thought, what on earth do you do with these? And somebody said, yeah, well, why don't you give them to the university library? So I approached the university library and said, are you interested? And he said, oh, God, no, we don't want books. It's true. It's true. I mean, the Edinburgh University Library is just full of computers. Absolutely. Every room is stacked with computers. Well, it was Harry and Watt, actually, because I have an association with Harry and Watt, and I said to them, are you interested? Oh, God, no, I don't want books. <laughs> what about the National Library or... The no, I mean, same thing, thing. But, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, nobody's interested in actually having hands-on mm -hmm. copies of stuff anymore, and you use it for what? Yeah. That's right, and I mean, the things that, I mean, knowledge, knowledge, because knowledge changes so quickly anyway, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. They say three years, three years, you know, for it, that's the, that's the life of it, and then it's moved on to something else, actually. So probably all I've said about culturalism and constructivism this, uh, this, after, this evening is probably... Probably no, no longer relevant, or you know, I mean, it's uh, that was then. <laughs> That's okay, wait a while, it'll come back. <laughs> was then? Well, I quite enjoy change actually. I mean, mm -hmm. I think change is one of the things that's in education for sure. me. But, you know, if everything stayed the same, I wouldn't have learned nearly as much as I have mm -hmm. learned. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why I enjoy coming to meetings like this. Yeah. And earlier on today, I was on an online meeting, which is an international group meeting, people from Spain, Brazil, Lebanon, mm -hmm. and so on. And I've learned so much from all that. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I think that, that that's a challenge that I never want to give up. You know, yeah. Education is not something that you do at university and that's it. Yeah. It's about how you live your life from then on. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I'm interested in particularly uh, is uh, to be for a personal reason as well, is how you maintain your mind in mm -hmm. older age. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the classic things that you have to do is to keep learning. Mm -hmm. That's right. Learning a language, learning a musical instrument, yeah, something uh, new, learning something, novelty. absolutely. Yeah. 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 And your wife in China just started in Hong Kong, isn't it? Oh, she's back now. Yeah. Oh, she's back now. My granddaughter in Hong Kong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't see her granddaughter. But yeah. Uh, and travel I mean, is one of the other things. I mean, I've done a fair bit of traveling in my life as well, and meeting different people in different circumstances. And a lot of it has not been touristy travel, it's been uh, engaging with local people and seeing things the way that they saw them. Uh, one of my great uh, things about China is that I always avoided China because. My early experience of China was during the Mao Zedong era, mm -hmm. Cultural Revolution, when we used to get Chinese students coming over to uh, Strathclyde University, that was that at the time, but they weren't just any Chinese students, they were the children of the political leaders, mm -hmm. and they came with uh, minders, cultural minders, who oh, yeah. were watching everything they did. Yeah. And they used to hand out Mao's little red book. <laughs> uh, they had some really weird ideas about you know, how the world worked. Mm -hmm. They were amazed, for example, at the Glasgow underground systems. Oh, gosh, we didn't think that anywhere else but China had underground systems. Mm -hmm. so, and the Glasgow ones, <laughs> you know, wait till you go to London. You know? That's but, uh, so I always avoided China having had that experience. But then when I married my wife, actually even before I got married and went to China and was living in the local community with her family, seeing how things were. I was kind of, that's a wonderful education. Mm. You know, a completely different side in many ways to what you get from that early uh, political mm -hmm. experience. And I think that openness is really important actually, that openness to different cultures and learning from cult those cultures yeah. actually. Again, that's about Changing the way we are, exactly. It's you know, true. making a new person. Actually, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, I lived in France for a year. I've lived in Italy for a while. I mean, these are all important, you know. And I, I don't. When I travel, I don't go as a tourist. Actually, I go because I want to go under the radar. I don't. I don't want to dress like a tourist. I want to learn. I want to learn about how people live. I want to see them re interact with one another. You know how they deal in a bar. Where they go shopping, these are important things mm -hmm. that influences me actually. Um, yeah. I think it does two things it's, it, it's not just about learning what you see out there, it's about making it 
you stepping out of where you were. That's right. Exactly. So it's the, it's the two, um, whether it's this culture or that culture, you're always going to get that. You're not locked in your own in exactly. your initial mindset. So. Exactly. Thank you very much. Not at all. Thank you. Talking about where I'm going to have to go. My wife will be with you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you, you've got copies of all three books. I've got them there, but I mean, it doesn't. Uh, but. Um, and very kindly uh, shared a link to her doctoral thesis. Okay. So uh, it's it's uh, I I know it will be a great accompaniment to the book. Um, um, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Not at all. It's not it's not that old. I I got my doctorate in two thousand and eight. So it's not that old. I mean, it's not nineteen sixty five. You know. So by all means have. Have a look. <laughs> <laughs> How many years did you do your PhD? I did it part time, so I did it in five years. Um, I think that was the minimum time to do it. That's on my bucket list. Well. On your bucket list. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very, thank you very much. Right, okay. Thank you. Nice right. to meet you. Thanks for organising that, Alex. That was really good of you. I'm going to pack up now. Well, very. Uh, yeah. It's it's uh, man up. And this, this is uh, interested people. The space, yeah. It's, it's great. A, it's a space. It's a place to be in the world. Yeah. And uh, that's why it's never. It, it's more precious than money. Absolutely. More, um, Absolutely. Money's not the issue. Not the issue, is it? <laughs>